Okay, the first order of business is the adoption of the minutes of October 16, 2014. We have a motion to accept these minutes. Well, I I number them. I know it's my page six, but your pages are not numbered. Oh, are they, they are. are. They are numbered. Well, it's page four, page four. I saw on your page four. Um, number seven on page four. Or, uh, it says here four or five. And it says here the. Um, uh, Mr. Jacobs requested information on authority to confiscate and not return an enemy. And, uh, and, I, and I, I do think this is very important. When I, I provided first to Mr. Jacobs, but then to the whole group, the legal authority that the animal care center does have to con to, and it's very important for you all to know they have they have legal authority to confiscate an animal, an animal in distress or from or in danger from a bad situation. They have legal authority to confiscate the animal. And then also legal authority to keep that animal permanently away from that bad home after a due process the, the, the the owner of the animals is entitled to get a hearing if they want. Uh, well, first they have to first they have to put up a a bond and then they get a hearing. But anyway, for the sake of the minutes, I did. say that this legal authority in the county is in county code sections 6.04.130 and 6.04.140. In the now I didn't bring my city code but just from memory I think it's six it's four point twelve. You could confirm that uh, Mr. James, I think it's from the city code, it's 4 12. So, what you're saying though is you talked about that in the minutes. Yes, I did. I gave the citation. All right, so then that, what you're saying is that that should be in, in the minutes. Yes, and that should have been, that should be in the minutes. In these minutes, it should be. 
be, it should no. be right there. Okay. Especially the citations to the law. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, so everybody knows the law really does authorize that animals be confiscated mm -hmm. and kept permanent. Is there any disagreement that, I mean, I wasn't here, is there any disagreement that that was discussed? No. no. So then it should be incorporated in the Okay. So that can be correct. Okay. Is there any other changes to the minutes? I will be approved the next introduction since we're in the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, with that, we'll have the first call to the audience. We're going to have, I'll, I'll limit those to about 20 minutes because we're going to have two calls to the audience, one at the beginning and one at the end. So the first one will be 20 minutes long, if, and up to 20 minutes. I'm not saying stretch it to 20 minutes. First person is signed. And if you want to speak, fill out. They're sitting over there, fill out a form. Uh, Mariana Parker. Well, thank you very much. My name is Mariana Parker, and I'm a volunteer at the Animal Care Center. And I have some things I'd like to say about the rescue program. First of all, I'd like to thank Jose because I know there was a confiscation of many cats this week, and he scrambled and he hurried and he got them spayed and neutered and found homes for many. And I want to thank you very, very much for that. Because it means a lot in my world. Okay. I'd also like to say that there are many rescues that are not happy with that right now. They're not being notified the way they should be notified of an animal coming in. If a pregnant dog comes in, I happen to know that Arms of Angels would be happy to be notified of that. They're not. Uh, they're, they'd be happy to take those animals given a 72-hour notice. They found homes. I've even loaned a crate to somebody for that reason. So I think that that's something that's very important to be looked at, and I want to also say there's seven dogs up for urgent right now, and I just came back from the tent. There's empty kennels all over the place. I don't know why those dogs have to die on Sunday with all those empty kennels. And some of those dogs don't have behavioral problems, they're just simply sick, and they're being medicated. I, I don't get the logic there at all. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I didn't say uh, earlier that each person talking has a maximum of three minutes, and around that time frame, I'll start putting you off. Okay? Uh, next person Tiffany Rossman. Hi. I had two points. Um, I don't know how valid the first one is since we've adapted the minutes, but I spoke last month and was misquoted in the minutes. Uh, there was a pregnant dog that a member of the public and a doctor came twice to see, and both times Chameleon was not updated that she had been spay aborted, and she was turned away both times to adopt. And in the minutes, it says that a rescue was turned away when, in fact, it was a member of the public, and I think that's a really important correction. My second point is I'm reading a letter written by Heather Binney, who is a volunteer for PAC. My name is Heather Binney. I have been a volunteer for PAC for almost a year. I've been invited to attend several PAC meetings on communication and focus groups for saving animals from euthanasia. Thank you to Tiffany Rosler, who is reading this on my behalf. I have a final exam at school and cannot be absent. On Wednesday, November 5th, I was walking the aisles of the main room. There was a small white pit bull with pink skin and giant black eyes that was barking and caught my attention. She didn't stop barking. Even when I leaned down to talk to her, she wasn't looking at me. I looked at her collar and there was a pink heart tag that said, Hi, I'm Odie and I'm deaf. I thought to myself she was probably blind too. I cautiously stuck my hand through the fence and touched her tin and she stopped barking. I took my hand away and she started barking again. I put it back in to touch her and the sweet girl stopped. She simply needed human contact. Odie was so sweet I knew her barking came from being scared, deaf and possibly blind. 
The only paperwork on their kennel was the bottom portion of the kennel cart. I could see intake was November 2nd. They knew that and knew that today, November 5th, was her evaluation. I took a quick picture of Odie through the fencing. It turned out as it turned out well at all, but I wanted to start networking ASAP to get her out of pack. Before I did that, though, I wanted to check with Simone to see how her eval went. Simone said that the evaluation was fine. She stated that she was deaf and she may have a skin condition and was possibly blind and was six years old. She said the rest of the paperwork was on the rescue coordinator's desk. Unfortunately, I had to leave, so I did not get more information on Odie. When I got home, I put Odie on Facebook and started networking that she was deaf and possibly blind. She received lots of interest and I knew she would get out of pack soon. Thursday, November 6th, I went back into pack to take a better picture of Odie. She was not in her kennel. I asked Simone where she was and she stated she thought she was in for pre-alter and Odie was at the clinic getting spayed. I was very happy. Friday, I went back into pack to take a better picture of Odie. She was not in her kennel, so I found Michelle to ask where she was. Michelle stated they put her down on Wednesday. I asked why. She stated that Odie was stressed out in her kennel because she would not stop barking. I asked, wasn't she blind and, what, and was deaf? Michelle said that there was no indication she was blind. Frantic because I already started networking her, I told her, I put her on Facebook. This is not going to look good when it gets back that she's deaf. Michelle told me to avoid this in the future. I should not pre-network dogs until they have been evaluated. I explained that I did ask Simone who did the evaluation and she found nothing wrong with her even though she thought she was being spayed on Thursday. Michelle told me that I should not network animals that have not been approved by herself or Justin. The evaluation staff has nothing to do with whether an animal lives or dies. I was shocked and saddened. This poor dog died because she barked excessively. She was an owner surrender on Sunday. Odie, animal number 500394, Owner died and the next of kin could not keep her. I left Michelle's office in shock and called Terry Goddard of Cold Red Noses. She was in shock as well and made a phone call to Michelle. I later found out that Michelle did admit to Terry that the dog was indeed blind. So this dog had a dual sensory impairment issued impairment issue and she was killed for barking excessively. Doesn't anyone know that dogs like this tend to be a little more noisier than others? Wouldn't the rescue coordinator know this? I still don't know why this dog was chosen to die. Imagine the positive response the community would have had if she had been networked properly. Someone on Facebook said this kind of dog would have garnered so much public support. This dog would have saved. Pact would have gotten kudos and many other people wanting to help special needs and dogs would have come out of the woodwork. Several months ago, I attended two focus groups and shared ideas how to keep more dogs alive. We spent hours in these meetings and I've yet to see anything at all come from what we shared. I would like to add that since she wrote this, there was an issue um, from those focus group, an email that was sent out responding to them. How hard would it have been to pick up the phone and call a few rescues about a blind, deaf dog? Odie and other animals like her deserve the right to be networked and saved, and I will never stop doing that. <coughs> I'm Terry Goddard, I'm with Tucson Cold Wet Noses, and I've been rescuing from PAC for nine years. And there's been a lot of disappointments, I think, for sure. So I wrote a little spiel. Time gets away from us sooner than later. With regular life, that's okay. When it's a matter of life and death, it's not. I had emailed PAC rescue staff five preventable points, which I believe can save more lives than PAC. This was sent to PAC staff over five weeks ago. One, requesting a once a week list of seniors. Two, requesting a once a week list of small special needs dogs. Three, requesting heads up of dogs in distress at least once a week. Four, 72 hour notice before aborting dogs or cats, immediate notification of possible pregnant, pregnant and mothers with babies. Five, when a purebred dog or cat comes into pack, to get that information over to the rescue coordinator or rescue staff so they can contact the purebred rescue organizations. Since then, starting just last week, the 12th of November, was the first time I had seen any of these changes implemented, implemented excuse me, by a very slow process, 
which I found to be quite ridiculous and absurd that saving a life should be put on a back burner for so long. Yesterday afternoon, November 18th, Justin Taylor, live release manager, reached out to me to explain the process of sending out a separate small special needs dogs list, which again was one of my requests made over five weeks ago. We, meaning the volunteers and rescue partners of PET, are still awaiting the following with no commitment date set forth as to when this will occur. Upon intake, intake all possible pregnant, pregnant or mothers with babies, volunteers and rescue partners are notified immediately of these dogs and cats so we can start the process of networking and getting them out of the pack. On a side note, in April of 2013, a meeting was held concerning 72-hour dogs and cats. One of the subjects was possible pregnant, pregnant and mothers with babies. In the meeting, it was set forth that rescues would be notified immediately so that rescues can take in possible pregnant, <coughs> pregnant and mothers with babies could start networking for hope foster homes as this is a very special needs animal. Also that rescues would be given a 72 hour window to take in pregnant moms before the babies were aborted. As of today, November 19th, this has not been respected or done as agreed upon. Though we might all not agree on what should happen to a pregnant dog or cat with babies as far as terminating the pregnancy, once an agreement was set forth, it should have been adhered to and has not been at all. And finally, that all purebred dogs upon intake are brought to the attention of the rescue staff at PAP so that the rescue staff, staff can begin to network these purebred dogs and cats to the applicable rescues and to also notify volunteers and rescue pack partners so they can also help network. We are still waiting for this process again after five weeks to get implemented. Also, a new early networking of high-risk dogs has been implemented. However, this is done by placing the high-risk dogs, animals, on a very long and lengthy daily rescue list. Though I find this to be progress, on the part of the PAC staff, I believe it would be more beneficial and outreaching to send a list of dogs and cats that the PAC staff is giving a heads up on that will be placed for short term via email. Though the daily rescue list is appreciated, it is designed to network special needs animals, not at high risk of being euthanized. Therefore, though it may, might be a bit more of the rescue coordinator's time, in the end, we should see a shift of animals moving out of the shelter that are on a short timeline instead of trying to get out in a frenzy within the five days they are given. We as a team can help these animals out pack. However, the rescue staff needs to make rescue and saving a life less of a chore in their minds and more of a focus and jubilation when the job is done right and animals are actually being saved. I find that resistance is met when it means changes need to be made, especially with my contact with the rescue staff at PAC. I find this resistance to go the extra mile on. Why, as the rescue staff, would you not want to extend and help the volunteers in rescues that help you every day? Perhaps it could be that it can be difficult to work with the rescue coordinator who is not <coughs> reached full maturity level, and therefore cannot understand constructive criticism as a good thing and a possible assistance to help the animals. We all need to be on the same page and have the same focus, and that is to save lives, move dogs and cats out of pack, so that room and space is no longer a viable reason to kill an animal in a pack. Unless these changes are made by the rescue staff, the slow boat to China attitude will not improve or save lives in the manner in which they can be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Okay, we have old business. Manager's report. Oh, I'm sorry. Manager's report and we're old business. Didn't mean to catch it up. I'm sorry. Okay. Chair members of the committee, thank you for your time. Um, as we probably all know, that uh, the uh, 415 was passed, so we'll be looking forward to uh, going to the 
process of building a, a facility that, you know, does, that will uh, provide uh, the type of sh uh, shelter in Kenlin and, and space for all the functions that we do, not just sheltering, but everything we do uh, using with, with a, in a modern layout with uh, a modern animal uh, welfare, animal care, uh, treatment of uh, the treatable and rehabilitable uh, September 23rd document uh, to, to Ms. Lesher and Mr. Garcia, uh, Mr. Huckleberry indicates a number of things need to happen, uh, and he talks about, well, a number of issues. And I'm kind of curious now that it's uh, September 23rd and we're at November 20th, about two months. What is the status of this? Is that what you're talking about over here, that the status is that they're talking with the city? At this at this point, the, the November 14th meeting just came out of the city and town voice to the county, some of their challenges and some of their thoughts and some of their feelings and how they could, could uh, receive more information in relation to how much our work and what it does. Uh, so we are just now in the initial stages of meeting with city and town representatives to, to talk through these, all these issues. This work there. I don't have any questions on that, but I have a question on the, on the, on the mm -hmm. did you, <coughs> should I just ask it, or are you, you going to talk about the, um, the, uh, the, the, operation the operational report, mm -hmm. uh, I had not planned, I was just there to answer questions, okay. uh, all right, well, the, the question 
and it's probably me just not understanding it, but when it comes down under other, under euthanized, under uh, this year to date, I mean, all the numbers are less this year to date than last year year to date when you're looking at that. The figures, 5,000, roughly 5,000 versus 4,800, and, and on and on and on. So when you're talking about the supply, I mean, the year to date versus this year to date, why is on the under, why is that now 1,800 versus 1,000? We're talking about the other category? Yeah. The, that category are, are our DOAs that we pick up, and the majority of that is the, the DOAs. Uh, there is a little rise in, in uh, driving account. And missing uh, this year to date, but the majority of it is, in fact, the DOAs that we're picking up, that that on arrival we're picking up off. The and we don't have a warning for that. Not separate. Okay. It's, it's one of the things that's included in other. It's part of the other one. Okay. okay. Then the other thing I had a question on is uh, under the enforcement. I noticed that we're we're making less welfare responses this year than we are last year. This year, year to date, we made 1,149. Last year, we made 1,233, which is a 7% decrease. And uh, knowing that we need enforcement officers, is that something that we just can expect from now on, that we're just going to, going to have less welfare checks? Well, the, the welfare Responses are not necessarily welfare checks. What they are are responses to uh, to abandonment, and we could once we get there, it could be uh, related to abandonment uh, of, of, and and, uh, uh, and and some other the, the, the serious uh, cases that we get where we get animals uh, that are in, in danger and, and harm's way. Uh, so it's not necessarily all the welfare checks. Some of those are just. To answer the question is that uh, uh, we uh, need to look into that as to uh, all the specific reasons the welfare response is going down. So it's a function of whether it's not getting as many calls because we do get all of those. And we get all of those that we get. Um, and and uh, others uh, are the reasons that uh, we are short staffed and we're trying to get up to our regular staff and move on with the fact that we, when I say short staff, we don't have all the positions filled and haven't had through the year uh, this year today. And, Obviously, there are many more calls to go on, response calls, including the loose, loose dog and, and hot dogs and those kind of calls than we actually get. So is that the same thing with enforcement calls for service? Yes, sir. I mean, we don't get less calls on that. I mean, right now, there's 9,200 versus 9,700. And, and that is a function of not staffing. Not having enough. Not having staff. So let's say right now we need more staffing, but we have open positions. I mean, so it's of our own doing to a certain extent that we haven't filled these positions, right? Yeah, we're trying to fill them as quickly as we can. I think we had a three or four week delay as the county changed, and freeze I should say, as the county changed from one automated system to another. So that delayed a little bit, but uh, the majority of that is, is again, uh, not having sufficient staff to, for all the calls that we'd like to be out to. Okay, that, that leads me to um, then, a letter that was sent to, and I think it's in our packet from Mr. Uh, Huckleberry, wherein the the committee sent a request for an increase in the officers, and I don't know where it's at in the packet, but essentially what it was, what we were told is that until we get more money from the city, the, our staffing is dependent upon the cities accepting or being a bigger participant than uh, as far as paying for it. So I guess that is why we're not getting. And I guess that leads me though where I'm going with that is is that where all our staffing now everything that has to do with PAC is it going to be as a result of the cities saying we have to have their permission. And if in fact that is the case, which it seems like it is the case, by virtue of this letter, does every department that provides a service to the cities are going to be under the same type of situation when they need to staff? Are they going to go to the cities with their budget and say, 
we need to hire some people. And then the city of Tucson says, no. What I'm saying is, is PAC going to be placed in its own position where we have to have the approval of the city of Tucson and Laurel Valley? Do they let everybody approve our staff? Mr. Chairman, the committee, uh, two points. First of all, we're early in the discussion with the city and town in relation to FEMA Animal Care Center contractual obligations and, and, and uh, their interpretation versus our interpretation of what, what should be funded and by, by IGA should be funded. Uh, the county at this particular moment uh, is still sending in the bills for exactly what we've always sent them for, for the whole range of services. Uh, however, some of that is either not being paid or they're not paying at all until this is resolved. We've got to work through that piece. We're early on in that process. Uh, obviously, that has to be resolved for the end of fiscal year, because so they can break down balance the book. But PAC is a unique uh, with the city and town in that we are a contract uh, facility for cities and towns. Other entities, especially, let me use another example of a section of emergency movement, the Consumer Health and Food Safety Division in the health department. There's no contract there. That uh, responsibility is a, a county health department responsibility, so it, it will be, it's city, not that city can have for permission to make changes there if you need to make changes. Um, and there are mo much, many, most of the county functions don't need to go to city and town to answer your question. Do they have contract with that? In any no, way, are there chargebacks? No. No. So PAC is the only one? Uh, not the only one. I think there's some wastewater related to the water. There's some wastewater water, city water department connections there that may have some similar situations. Um, uh, but, and, and maybe even some solid waste and kind of floor familiar with some of those, uh, those public services. But I know PAC is unique in the way its contract is arranged with the city. Well, I'll hold them for now. <laughs> I can learn more about it. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yes, Ms. Schwein. There's a question that I, we can put under, under the manager's report. It was mentioned by Dr. Lilly in the last meeting that the felony uh, cases are held here longer. She said felonies take more time than misdemeanors. She was talking about the length of time that animals are held here. And it should not be that that when that uh, felony cases take longer than misdemeanors. That that is something that's an error that's that should be corrected. There's nothing in any law that requires uh, that uh, that when an animal that <coughs> When somebody is, has been given a citation for a felony for abuse of an animal, there's no law anywhere that, at all that says that animal needs to be held longer. And it, it's a really a bad thing. It works, it works just to the detriment of the animal. Because in, in, in cases that are considered worse, or where the animal has been abused even worse than usual, then you hold the animal here longer, which is just the second thing that Ron that's done to the animal. <coughs> now, could you change that, please? There's no law. I don't know who is saying that the felony cases should be held longer, but it's wrong. Mr. Shereen, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, generally, felony cases, you do deal with much more severe injury and illness. And, and multiple animals with, with uh, many problems that need a little more time to rehabilitate and um, return to their owner. And uh, not return to the owner, I'm sorry. Not return to the owner, but to, re to rehabilitate. And, um, and there's a forensic reason that that needs to be done to present to the judge that at the end of that recovery time. I, we're not, there's no, I don't think there's any disagreement that once they're recovered, yeah, let's get them out of here. And how we recover them maybe doesn't have to be here, but through a foster program, which we now have more, uh, uh, more, more, a little more robust and, and should look at that as a, a, an option for rehabilitating some of these pets uh, as we can. But again, uh, when you're, when we're preparing information evidence for, for court cases, 
uh, you got to be a little bit careful about letting it just go to, to anyone. So all of that is part and parcel of, of, as we do. Uh, what do you mean letting it go to anyone? If you had a foster program for felony cases, you need to be, be careful not just to have just anybody take them because there's a chain of evidence issue and, and a responsibility to provide information that's credible and that, that, uh, that, is, that, that uh, will survive the uh, judicial tests that they have to go through. So, for those reasons, for the forensic uh, recovery process, they do take a little time, but once they're recovered, you're right, there's no reason to hold on to them. Well, I, I, I didn't mean once they're recovered. I understand that. You see, I, I disagree with, with the idea that you have to keep them to, to, to win a case because the Animal Control Center has a record of being really good at winning cases with, with animals that they have not kept. And I've always admired the Animal Control Center and the, the, when they, when I used to go to these trials, these misdemeanor trials down in City Court and County Court and the, the animal control officers would testify as to what they saw, and it was similar to, to writing the, the reports that we have in our, in our packet, where they write such, they were really great at writing the descriptions of the animals that they're suffering, and their word is always taken, and they say the animal has no water in the and then they gave, <coughs> gave the animal water, and the animal drank very thirstily. Their testimony has always been believed in court. Sure. And they have never... Oh, but just one second. The reason I'm interrupting you is that is part of our own business. I will reach that, hold the thought, right now, what you were talking about, because I brought that up. It's under the vet holds and confiscation. If you look on there, process procedures, ways to shorten length of hold. And where is that? It's under our own business, and I'll be, getting, I'll be getting to that. All right. And so that'll be the time to start to bring that up. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves <coughs> because I have some questions on that myself. So hold that thought. Okay. Are we still on operation? No, we're at this point now. Are we complete the operation? Do you have, does anybody have any more questions on the operate on the report manager? I have, I have a very long comment to make. I think that operations is a place where I bring this up because I have a concern of some of the things that you know, the volunteers do have your concerns about what goes on in the shelter. I have my concerns about what goes on in the shelter. And this is a very emotional topic for me, so I'm going to do my best to, to get through this. But about eight, a little over eight years ago, the Pima County Sheriff's Department, Pima Animal Care Center, and the Humane Society of Southern Arizona collaborated in a courting case of over 800 dogs. Uh, it was it was just horrible. Doctor um, here, she did some of the surgeries on these animals, and um, it was a really horrible situation. And I remember uh, Justin was there as well. And I remember walking out into these god awful dirty pens with all these dogs. And I reached down and I picked up a Japanese chin in my arms, so I was going to go load her into the crate um, in, in, in our motorhome. And as I picked her up. I I felt or heard, I don't know what it was, something on the ground. And as I picked her up, she passed a puppy and it hit the ground. And I reached down and because I've had experience, I was able to revive this puppy, get it breathing, and we got the animal in the van, took it to the right to the Humane Society. We had numerous vehicles there and she went by herself to the Humane Society where she delivered her puppies and she was fostered into a home and these puppies were raised to be adopted. Uh, there were many male puppies and many male dogs at this facility, but the majority of the animals were females, and if they weren't nursing, they were lactating. You know, there was there was no no difference in this. And um, as the Humane Society of Southern Arizona, we had a huge responsibility because while PAC and the Sheriff's Department helped us round up these animals, the care of these animals was on us and our volunteers in the community and our uh, and our Humane Society volunteers. And um, that night, probably four or five dogs whelped. Um, there were numerous dogs that were ready to whelp. And our veterinarians, with the assistance of veterinarians in our community, worked like hell 
to get these advanced pregnant dogs spayed before they have these puppies. And I do not understand, as an animal control organization who, who like the Humane Society, your goal is prevention, that you would allow pregnant animals to go out into foster homes. It makes no sense to me. And I just need you to explain that. Please. I mean, we are prevention. Our job is to prevent these puppies from inundating our community. I agree with you completely. Thank you, Jane. And I just feel that we're doing an injustice by adding more puppies to this problem where we have six, seven, eight dogs in a kennel, and these dogs need homes. These puppies, we know we can place these puppies. That's a no-brainer. We don't need the puppies. We need homes for the dogs. And I'm just so frustrated, and I, and I understand it's an emotional, it's a hugely emotional issue. You know, but we are, um, we have a tendency, as people who care about animals, to be anthropomorphic, where, you know, we put, well, this is how I feel, but animals don't feel the same things that humans do. We're human, they are animals. And our job is to take care of them. And for me to see a beautiful dog come into the shelter who's been re rejected, she's been turned away, and she's pregnant, and then we ask her to go through a, a pregnancy and feeding these babies, what about her? You know, let's get her spayed, let's get her a home, and let's think about her. And I know it's emotional, I'm really sorry, but I don't understand how you guys are doing this. Can you explain to me why you're letting pregnant animals leave here? Please? Well, at this point right now, I understand what you're saying. Um, if you want to direct that, you're trying to direct that. I'm directing this to staff. To staff. Yeah, and that's what staff is here for, to answer these questions, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, there has been a lot of discussion about this topic in the last six weeks or so. Um, and I, I don't... <laughs> This is a tough one for us as well, um, because we, uh, a lot of us feel, um, and other shelters, other other organizations, um, feel the same way that you are saying. Um, it's not a feeling, it's a job. We are prevention. Our job is to prevent puppies from being born. That's what we signed on to do when we took this job. And certainly, um, out of respect for this advisory committee, if that's something that you would like to weigh in on and set that as a policy for us, we would be open to that as well. Um, we certainly have a, a lot of pushback from what you've seen in your packet, and unfortunately, um, it puts us in this position where we're, where we're moving to make the decision that we make. What, okay. I guess I don't understand. There is no decision to make. Your job is prevention. Your job is to keep these animals from being born. You need to do that job. And I understand that the, that the volunteer groups, they want to save lives. They don't have 24,000 animals a year coming into their facilities. They have one or two or ten. But you can't. You're the county. You're responsible for these animals, and it's your responsibility, just like it's the Humane Society's responsibility, not to put these puppies on the ground. I mean, I know they're born in the kennels. You can't help that, and we certainly want to save all of those. But if they haven't delivered, then why are we delivering them? We don't need those puppies. We need homes for those mothers. I'm sorry. It's just a really emotional topic for me. I mean, Dr. I, you know, I just want to make a comment, and that is, um, that it's always sad not to be able to save a life. But my, the way that I, I work a great deal with the uh, animal leader of Green Valley, and my policy, and I told them that uh, if they want to do it differently, they can go deal with some other veterinarian. But what, what I do is anything that is pregnant, they bring to me, you know. I spay them immediately. If the puppies are viable what, at the time of spay, if they can make it, you know, fine. That's okay. But if they're, uh, if they're not that close to term and would not make it, um, with having me spay them at this, spay mom at this time, then I'm sorry, I uh, will totally agree with that kind of uh, action. So that's just my feeling on this Yes, Doctor. Can I ask a medical veterinary question? Can you, I don't know if Doctor, you actually want to answer. You can spay a dog that's pregnant up to any 
time close to term. Basically, you can. You can. You can spay them at the time you do a C-section. But when you're doing that, you're delivering live puppies. That's right. But I mean, you can you can spay them basically, and the puppies are being euthanized if they're not viable. Yeah, we'll say they're three weeks along or four weeks right. or five weeks along. If you if they're, they're, they won't survive on their own. How close to term can you get before they won't survive? I'm sort of, sort of looking for like a cuddle point. Well, you know, you're, for, you're comfort, for people's emotional comfort. Typically, you know, the normal pregnancy is about nine weeks. Okay. Okay. Um, in my experience, um, unless you make valiant efforts, you're not going to be able to to uh, save anything that's the that's beyond, uh, uh, say, eight weeks. You do it as Eight weeks, you know, some or other puppies might survive on their own unless you um, work make that in okay. yeah. And it's not a dangerous operation for the mother. Not any more so than having the puppies. Okay. Thank you. I see, Mr. Oh, okay. I agree with you. And something that I think it's important to say is I think that there's a lot of decisions that we don't make because as the professionals we go against what our professional opinions are because we do this every day it's told us we're the paid employees which means not only do we do this here but many of us have experienced that exceeds far beyond this place and i find myself in a place where i'm having to compromise on the decisions i know i need to make as a professional to appease rescues and volunteers and it goes against my better judgment. But your job is to these animals. It's not. I agree. And it's I, not I, anybody else. No, I agree. And I really want, and I'm committed to getting. Then make the right place. decisions for these animals. That's your job. And I don't mean to be no. hard on you, Jose, but the fact of the matter is, it's your responsibility not to bring more animals into this community. I agree with you. you know why are we? We're trying to become a no. Well, we are not trying. We are going to become a no kill community, and we're not going to get there if we're if we continue to whelp puppies and send them out into the community. It's not going to happen. Our job is to stop this from happening. Your mm -hmm. job, our job is to be made society. That's our, our mission, that's our goal. Um, Mr. Chairman, there's a committee. It's possible. There's another um, agenda item where this sort of topic leads into that, and um, if at that point I could maybe address a little bit more. rescues? Yeah. Mr. Jacobs, that was your agenda item. Is that okay with you to get started on that? You might put it there. Okay. Let's let's move to let's move to the rescue, which is new business, and we'll jump back to old business as we go along. All right. Um, so I just want to sort of explain how this leads into the discussion on the rescue mm -hmm. groups, and you know this was again a challenging one for me to figure out how to talk to this committee about because. Um, I want to make sure that we continue to be respectful of those partners that are so important to us, being rescue and all of our volunteers. I do also think it's important for everyone to know, again, what Jose is saying, that it is difficult sometimes to make those decisions that we know we need to make. For example, um, there was one threatening bill that came after we had this discussion, um, which, again, I. I didn't include because I'm trying to be respectful of our rescue partners, but it does become increasingly difficult to make those decisions Decisions when on a daily basis um, we are getting, the threats don't come that often, <laughs> that one did, um, but called names, um, curse at, uh, for the decisions that we're trying to make. And so we wanted to come up with a solution here, and we have found um, uh, code of conduct agreement um, that we'd like to work with you guys and, and next week if you next week next month if you'd be willing to put that on the agenda to have a copy for you to review that we could move forward in, in establishing um, respectful communication from all sides from from our staff from the, the partners the people that we work with because we agree that in a lot of ways communication has broken down um, and I think that this is a way to help us get back to that point where we can all work with each other respectfully. I know that doesn't exactly tie in to what you said, but that is what we are facing as the, the paid people here, that it, it has become harder to make those decisions. I don't know if Chris wants to add. So 
I can't speak sitting down, so I will stand up. Um, the, so I'm Francisco Garcia. I direct the health department, and the PAC, the Animal Care Center, is part of the portfolio of responsibilities that I oversee. Um, and we really, as a team, as a leadership team, have been really struggling with what the right balance is in terms of taking into account volunteer, stakeholder, rescue group input, packet act advisory committee input, which we think is slightly different because of ordinance issues, um, and how we balance it all together. And one of the things that we've decided to do is that in order to not face these kinds of issues um, where there's this going back and forth, that we need to enshrine in policy very specifically what our limits are going to be. And, and quite honestly, um, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Hubbard, um, that is one of the limits that, we're that we want to place a policy in because we think it makes sense from, a, from, a, um, from the perspective of an animal care center and from the uh, perspective of an animal uh, welfare institution. And, and just quite honestly, it, it, it is the only thing that is sustainable and, and um, defensible. I wanted to share with you something that is in your packet. Um, which is a handout, um, which I believe they all have, right? No, oh, sorry. I think you need the handout. I need to hand out the handout. What I wanted, one of the big things that, that Kristen and the team and Kim and I have really spent a lot of time talking about has been what is the big picture here? Um, because I think that in terms of the welfare of animals, um, sometimes we lose what the big picture is. And we have some for the audience too. Sometimes we, we lose track of what the big picture here is. Um, and if our goal is to maximize um, the number of animals that are rescued, what are the smart ways that we can get to that goal? Um, and one of the things that I'm actually quite <laughs> proud of is the fact that, as you can see from the graphic, since 2010-2011, we have increased the number of adoptions um, very significantly, by 57%. This has been the work of our staff, this has been the work of volunteers, this has been the work of a lot of different people. Um, and in fact, a lot of animals that in the past would have been destroyed, um, are actually being saved. You can see that our special needs adoptions, for instance, have increased by 109%. We're up to 1,221 in the last 12 months. That's a lot. That's a hell of a lot. That's impactful. Um, and we think that that is very cool, too. You know, this is what we are working for with our partners collaboratively. The role of the rescue groups continues to evolve. And at one point, we were very, very reliant on the rescue community to, to pull animals from this facility to help us not destroy those animals, quite honestly. And you can see that, that since 20, the 2010-2011 um, year, um, we, the amount of animals going to rescue organizations has steadily gone down. Um, and we don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. We have a very engaged rescue community that has, in some cases, very specialized interests um, and that help us place very, um, sometimes very difficult to place or sometimes not so difficult to place animals. One of the things that we realized as this number of stakeholders has increased, we've increased the number of rescue partners by 40% in the last five years is that it gets harder and harder for us to effectively serve them and, and provide them the information that they need. And the staff and I have talked a lot about what can we do to make this much more of a self-service model because no number of reports that we run will ever be sufficient to outline the many different ways that we can cut up, um, that we can divide up that list of animals. But one of the things that we really believe is that by putting that hand, that information in the hands of the rescue organizations, they can decide what their priorities are. 
and they can decide what animals, what pets can be networked successfully and which ones they might not be able to. Quite honestly, as this policy evolves, some things will have to be off the table. And the pregnant, the situation of, of pregnant pets is likely to be one of those things that has to come off of the table as being a possibility being networked out. So that's the big picture in terms of how we're thinking about it. Making, putting the, 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 the information in the hands of the rescue partners, we're struggling with, with chameleon and with some of, the, <coughs> some of the things that IT is going to have us do in order to give our rescue partners that kind of access to what is essentially an internal system, um, to give it to them in, in this location so that they can best find out at whatever time they choose what animals are available for rescue. But, but be very, to be very clear, we will have a very set, uh, uh, a very well-defined set of policies and procedures that are going to define that universe of animals. Because just for the reasons that you mentioned, Ms. Hubbard, for the reasons that um, have been discussed at, at length by a number of you, um, it is just not not feasible, nor is it impactful. At the end of the day, we have to do two things in this jurisdiction. We have to continue to decrease the intake of animals that are being taken into this facility. And we have to increase the number of adoptions. And the way that we have to do that has to be in a way that has the greatest impact. Um, and for us, um, focusing on special needs adoption has actually yielded tremendously. Focusing on partnering with volunteers to adopt out and to divert animal intake has worked tremendously. And those are the things that we think are going to have the highest impact. But that was all I wanted to say, Mr. Newman, um, uh, members of the advisory committee. I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions about this. I have a question. Yes. Um, The animals that, when, when you you talked about that meeting that you had uh, with the staff, where they said that they were going to contact you when pregnant animals are in there, why would I mean why would the county even say well, that? Well, I mean here you've given a, you've I, given them I, I, uh, what 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 that meeting was, and I was if I if I oh, it wasn't the meeting that I was at. Oh, sorry. So <laughs> so. Perhaps we overstepped in terms of making that a commitment. I have been at a variety of kind of brainstorming sessions um, that have been facilitated by our friends at, um, at um, No Kill, no Kill no Pima, Pima County, County that have been facilitated by, by the team at No Kill Pima County. At that time, a lot of ideas were generated. The idea then is to take some of those ideas that were generated and say, which ones are feasible, which ones are impactful, which ones can actually be done by us versus by someone else. Um, and, um, and, uh, and if we did that, it, it, it probably was not, um, it was probably in, in, in our zeal to be responsive to our community partners and we are beholden to our community partners, um, we may have overstepped. So what is the next step in making policy? So that it's not a question that anybody has to make a decision. The policy is, in, in, is set up. Nobody has to make a decision. There doesn't have to be discussions between PAC staff and rescuers. How do you get a policy set up? I think the, the committee should make a motion, and then we should vote on it. Is that possible? I, I, I think policies, the first step should come from the director, where when, uh, if, if I was running that, that I'd want to put out what it is that I want because that's your jerk. And so as a result they come to us, we look at it and just make recommendations. And and it goes back. The final say is still the director's say. Uh, Mr. Jacobs. I, I heard two things. One is managing information. That's a technical management problem which I have no doubt you and the staff are going to be able to handle Where I think this committee should be involved, because I don't, I, I'm, I did not hear a clear policy, no procedures. In fact, I heard that they're debating those with, within the staff, and 
therefore are unable to communicate them. That it's not a communicated problem, it's the lack of having a clear policy or a set of procedures that you want that you that you think should be followed. And I think we as an advisory committee the chairman just indicated should be informed of that, what they are in writing, ask give the opportunity for any of the members of the community, those who are affected to submit whatever they wish, and then we'll be able to give them what our advice is. But until you have those those clearly and distinct and distinctly uh, I would say enumerated, we're not going to be able to help you. Or anyone else. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Jacobs, um, to that point, you're absolutely right. Um, we have a draft that's not ready for prime time. We have been careful to try to have as much stakeholder input as we develop these things, get as many opinions, because we certainly don't believe that any one person has the, the absolute solution. And our plan was to actually have that policy to you at the next meeting for your information and feedback as the step before we sort of take it live. Mr. Chairman, I would table, I would move to table the, the issue of rescue until next, next week so we may discuss, discuss it and work and uh, discuss it further. We have a second. Okay. So we have a second. Any discussion on that as far as tabling it until the next meeting? I do. Until we have. I have a question. Um, what I brought up under operations would have been more appropriate had I brought up under rescue. But isn't there a reason that the rescue is on the agenda? It wasn't about what I brought up. It is on the agenda. That's why I moved towards it. Yeah. And that's why. But I mean, why are we not going to talk about who put this on or what, why we have this agenda? The rep, the, what I heard, you know, what I heard last meeting was a discussion of the problem that, from the rescue organization's point of view. I took that into consideration. I now hear the staff's point of view, and my conclusion is we need to have the document that the doctor just said he would be able to provide us next month, and to discuss it in the blind is to be blind. Yep, yes, I get it. Uh, doctor. Yeah, I, I, I agree with both of you, but they, you know, they, we need to remember that the fundamental reason that this committee was originally formed, and I've been on it since it was formed, uh, is to be an advisory committee. And, uh, uh, the, and that means that with input from everybody who choose to have input, that we advise the center of what policy should be, and then you know the center can choose to either listen to our advice or, or partially listen to it and uh, uh, and act accordingly. Uh, but uh, let me tell you that uh, when the committee with information makes an advisory decision that typically it's something that is uh, uh, weighed well and uh, in most cases is accepted by the center. Okay? That's all I want to say. Anybody else? I would like to answer several of the things that Dr. Garcia said. May I do that? Uh, well, if yeah, you're tabling I, it, if, well, if we're going to table I'm, it till next. Well, okay, so you, okay. <laughs> you have five minutes to answer. If you can answer in five minutes, some of right. the And it may touch on some of the things that are, that, that, from different things that are going to come up later, but I want to do it all at once because I'm answering uh, Mr. Gar uh, Francis Garcia. Now keep in mind, you may be doing this again next, we're going to do this again next month. Well, this okay. is a, a right now, I'd like to do it right now. Um, on four, four um, points that you made, um, you mentioned in a very favorable way that about decreasing the intake of animals. 
which is nice. The second point is about increasing adoptions, which sounds good, but it has not been, in my opinion, as, as good as it could be because they have, they are not, the, we, we, not screening the new adoptions and not screening the new adopters as well as they should, even though the law says that they, that adoptions must go to, adopted animals must go to suitable homes. But nothing is being done to see, not enough, not enough is being done to see that these are suitable homes. And they, they are, I mean, you could increase adoptions even more if you stood on a street corner and just handed them out to anybody. That, that way you could really increase adoptions. But it, it can't just be done willy-nilly. It needs to be done in a considered way. And we have an example in our packet today, number WC8, about an animal that was, that was found. Uh, they, its chain had gotten all tangled up and when the animal control center got there, the uh, dog could not even sit down. And this dog had been adopted from the animal care center. And, and another thing on that point, a lot of these people, these new adopters, cannot afford um, a veterinary care. And, and I know that since it's my organization that provides uh, veterinary care. That's, that's what we exist for, is to help people with um, providing veterinary care. So we get calls from people who have just adopted an animal from the animal care center and then they say, my dad, my dog's sick or got run over and I have no money for veterinary care and I need your help. So we need to be more careful about increasing adoptions. The mere number alone is not, a good, is not good. You have to know who got these animals. And <clears throat> The really big picture that I think could help the whole situation a great deal is a massive increase in spaying and neutering of dogs and cats. And in that connection, I favor passing two laws, uh, which, the, which we could ask the supervisors to pass, and I do believe that laws work requiring, requiring spaying and neutering, and the, the less effect, less uh, widespread law that we should pass, and I've been in favor of this for many years, is a law that that all pit bulls should be spayed and neutered. Um, um, and I don't see how anybody can be against that. You know, we're all supposed to be in favor of spaying and neutering. Be included in the packet for our review. Okay. Uh, back to old business. A while back, uh, I had jotted down 22 items uh, very quickly, so it was not all encompassing as to what was going on in the shelter. Um, one of the main things that we hear a lot is uh, we can't get things done because of staff. So. And I know things are, a lot of things are getting done. And, and even with that, that major issue of staffing, staffing on enforcement, staffing on a lot of areas, and be, even being turned down from staffing. So at least for the director to understand that in large part, there's a lot of frustration when it comes to uh, the, the volunteers. And because essentially the adoption program is almost 95% at least volunteers. Very difficult for an adoption coordinator to round all of us up if we're adopting people out because we don't have to show up and we don't have to do everything that people say. So the influence that volunteers have essentially is very high because we're the ones doing a large part of the work. And the one way to make sure that you can run it the way you want to run it, which would be hopefully the right way, is to not have volunteers so entrenched by doing everything. Certain things maybe volunteers should help, like in the adoptions like they do at Humane Society, 
to not be the sole providers of adoptions and the sole provider of a lot of things. My two cents. So, um, with that though, I wanted to ask about the, like an update on the 22 items. Um, so, Mr. Kanye, I know that you're going to talk about that. So, staffing hasn't changed, but we've changed. <laughs> um, we've changed a lot of things operationally. One fundamental change is we've changed inmate vendors. So now, so we're calling them vendors, but it is. We've moved to women, female inmates, um, and they are much more detail-oriented. They're much more compassionate. The shelter already is a lot cleaner than it has been in years. They take, they understand that cleaning is not just cleaning, but it's disinfecting, it's stopping the spread of disease, and by stopping disease, it lessens the pressure of our medical team and on rescues and volunteers who have to really help adopt these animals out. So that has been really nice because they're also, when we say this animal's thin, it needs food twice a day, or it needs a special bed, they, they are taking it upon themselves to do it. One of the things that's fundamentally different about this program is that they're not managed by just CEOs, they're managed by um, like senior custodials, which means they're being trained by the, by the um, Pima County. As opposed to before, it was a shelter supervisor who was constantly being pulled away to actually engage the inmates, train them, and really facilitate the programs, and the CEOs are basically just counting all day long. And so what this is enabling us to do is for the supervisors to take on more of an actual supervisory role in the shelter, engaging the staff, it's going to open up opportunities for training and having more presence. One thing that's really changing is I'm now overseeing the clinic, and so we are kind of over, we're going to be changing a lot of things. One thing is I'm, we have a shelter supervisor that was allocated to the clinic that we're moving back to the shelter. So we'll have four supervisors, which means we will finally have a position available where a supervisor's sole job is to be there in the morning to be like a floor supervisor. We'll have in the same day we'll have a supervisor overseeing the operations that were open, and we'll have a night supervisor overseeing the closing procedures. Um, there's a lot of wasted time that happens all the time. We had a subcommittee meeting um, with volunteers. Um, Streaming was a part of that on kennel cards. At any given time, you could walk into you know just near Michelle's desk and you'd see a pile of 50 cards each. So we are we work with the process so that um, kennel cards stay on the kennel. We actually just kind of slowly implemented it a few days ago, where we're using Chameleon um, in our software to where they they're working off a report and it's changing the dynamic of how they evaluate the animals and we're getting a lot of good reviews from Justin thus far. So though we have an increased staff, we are constantly looking at things we can do with what we have, switching it around and getting creative to increase our operations and make the quality of care better. I mean, we still have more animals than we can care for. And so we are still running into situations where we are missing things. And we will continue to miss things until we get staff. Because you can only become so efficient to a point um, with having a certain amount of resources. So we are going to be approaching that very, very soon. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. I'd also like to add, um, this is an example of some of the larger future things that we're looking to, to try and restructure because we understand that right now we're not getting more resources and so we're trying to use all of the resources that we have as as smart as we can, as efficient, we want to be as efficient as we can be. And so we do spend some time um, looking at restructuring things like this so that big picture we can free ourselves up to do more. And so sometimes some things take a little bit longer or don't get the response, and it's not because um, this team doesn't care. It's because we're looking at ways that we can continue to be better and better because that ultimately is what all of us want. Thank you. Thank you. I, I personally agree with you. There is, PAC is tremendously understaffed, particularly if you compare it to similarly situated cities throughout the country. So with that in mind, it's not like we've just given up and just because we get a letter saying, yeah, we're not going to do it. So we're going to still be taking that upon ourselves to, to look at that. Um, you can't run when you're just compared to, let's say, Albuquerque, when you're just in the shelter part, 40 to 50 personnel less than just Albuquerque, just the shelter part. That's significant considering, you know, it's like about three times more than you have been. So, I mean, with that, then we begin to depend a lot on volunteers. And then when you depend on, on other people, then their opinions 
and what they say mean more. And, and that's one way to get out from underneath some of that. So, um, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, there was, um, on vet holes and confiscations, which is what you were talking about, that was only that part of it, uh, ways and procedures to lengthen that whole time. And we got into a little bit of that as to how to do that. Uh, did you did you want to speak to that as to how it, it would be? I have some questions on the, as far as what we do. Well, first of all, on the, on the enforcement part, Right here, the this part that was sent to us, I don't understand it at all. I mean, it says if you look at the, the sheet, confiscate, feel the normal activity, and then really I, I can't make anything out of it. Why is it there? <clears throat> How long is it going to be there? What's the reason for it there? We I mean, all look the same, um, and we all have it in our back. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, um, the, the each uh, in the force, uh, well, in, in the report it starts out by uh, it's categorized by either enforcement or vet hold. So you have two different sections. Within each of those sections, there's a set of uh, set of activities and or kennel card, or kennel cards so, and or kennel cards. Um, it's organized, uh, for example, the first page on the top is underneath the King Animal Care Center Animal on a full report. It has full type enforcement. The, the, the next set of animals are held at the front because the enforcement has asked them to be held. There's many reasons to, to hold such for enforcement. One is if, if an owner comes in to redeem an animal, enforcement wants to let staff know in licensing, we usually sometimes deal with these injuries first, or the shelter who may deal with them first. That, uh, you really need to talk to enforcement first. We've got some things we need to talk about, citations, and talk to them about them. what to you know, Just investigate the case. If the animal was uh, picked up or um, returning loose and had some problems that, that we're concerned about that need to be investigated. So that's a hold right, right there for those animals. If the three-day hold and the owner doesn't show up, then that, that, or that enforcement hold is lifted at that point so that the animal can proceed after three days. Um, in other words, in some cases, an animal is impounded without knowing who the owner is, but it's got some enforcement challenges. And because it's therefore straight with possible enforcement action, it's only held three days. But enforcement puts a hold on it. So staff, if the owner comes in in those three days, talk to the enforcement. Okay, let, let's back up. <clears throat> so you had A14-159425. That one. Right. Towards okay. the bottom. Right. So, and, and a lot of them look like that. So if I'm just a lay person looking at that, then... A14-159-425 is the activity number. That is the enforcement activity number okay, for that case. Okay. The animal, each gray line is an animal line. It starts an animal line. The K number is the kennel record number, which is a unique number for that impound for that animal. The next number, the A500827, is the animal's ID number that is unique to that animal. So every time that animal comes in and identifies that animal, it will be reported in as A500827. It's a, it's, it's a dog, it's named in Cinco, it's a pit bull. So that's what that first line is, identifying information. The next line is, is the date and, and some notes about how it came to be in the shelter. 11514 is the day that it was impounded, it was confiscated from an owner because it says he was owned, confiscated in the field from an owner, and the dog's condition on appearance by the enforcement officer who impounded it, well, it was normal. It didn't, it didn't see any medical any medical issue with the pet. Again, the activity number is repeated, and the D071 number on the right is the kennel number where the dog is at the time the report is, is prepared. Uh, the kennel comment or the comment uh, field in the in the kennel window uh, where certain notes are put. The challenge of the kennel field is it can be changed, and so we don't rely a whole lot on the kennel field. But for purposes of the, uh, these reports, we like to include there 
because that's where we find things. Where the, the and it's also right up front on the kennel window when a staff member pulls it up so they can see it. And so that's where enforcement tells the folks, this is a dangerous dog. We need to hold it for a dangerous dog issue. Uh, the person, that, the owner that it's associated with, is the P number, the P three five three six. That's the owner's number. Uh, again, uh, there's a couple other numbers down there that refer back to some previous or related cases to that animal that's being on hold. Um, and just for your information, that animal is forfeited by their owner when the final product in one eleven seventeen to the to the to the, to the shelf. And that's not in the report, that's just some follow up about So that's the organization of each one of them. Now. And, and you can see there's other notes up uh, on the first one that talks more specifically about all the issues and the fact that that's a bond. Uh, and we're waiting for the owner to come in and we're trying to make contact with the owner. He said, yes, I, I, I do want the 10-day time to place my, uh, to play, pay my money. And that will be, uh, that time period will be up on 11 26. So he has until 11.26 in the case of the, the A12-102-940 case uh, to come in and pay the bond before we take it to the judge and get down early. This is the problem. Yeah, I know. I was, okay. I was going back down with this one. How do you know, again, um, did you just say it came in 11.5 and you said on 11.17 what? Uh, well, I looked at the record. And, and uh, on 11, and this again, this report is prepared on 11 14 was sent to you on 11 14. Since then, on 11 17, the owner came in and, and re released, uh, released the ownership to the center and forced the animal to the animal care center. So, when would know that until next month? We wouldn't, well, we wouldn't even know that at all because it wouldn't show up. See, that, that, that's part of the problem. <clears throat> that. Well, we wouldn't know what happened. I mean, we don't know what happened. Are, are you looking to have a history of every animal that you look at? Is that what you want? No. What, then I can certainly, you know, we can certainly put that together for everyone that comes to an enforcement report. But this report is a, a snapshot in time. On the 14th, this is the hold through there. Uh, we've had, we had an animal since 11.6 through 11.14, 11.5 through 11.14, 11.5. Uh, we had a mass impound of a bunch of chickens. A dog and a turkey. A turtle, not the turkey. Uh, and the turtles. Uh, they've also since been resolved. Uh, they came in on uh, uh, they came in on 11 9. Uh, within, again, those are within the seven day owner hold time. It doesn't afford to continue to do something with them. So, um, uh, so, what this report is saying that on 11 6, uh, the seven days, uh, the report printed on 11 14, we had an animal. That we brought in on 11 6 to confiscate the first case there. And what's, why is this animal passed that seven days? Well, the notes are in here saying we're, we're working with Mr. West Fall. He's supposed to come in. We talked to him on 11 10. Uh, working with him 11 10. So now uh, we need to see him again. And when he finally came in, we gave him until 26, which is 10 days after 16. So from 11 6, 11 16, 16. Okay, that's a little long. That's more than seven days. But we do work with owners because it is their property. And we have to have, we have to be a little bit careful about just, just rushing through this process. So now that was a little longer. 11.5, it also is a little bit longer. But again, this was an aggressive dog um, that we needed to work with the owner on before we, right, before we did anything else. Uh, uh, which, in essence, that particular animal in that second case uh, was euthanized because of aggression. I'm the uh, on the whole type that yes, sir. what we're saying is we have two? Yes. That's correct. On this day. As of the 14th, we were two vet poles. The, and the first one, 10 11, what are we doing with them that long? Well, I'll tell you what we're doing with the straight field injured severe pet that long. We forgot the outcome that day. It should have been an outcome. I'm sorry, the last page. The last page? Of the report. Page 14, 157, 712. That animal should have been outcome on, um, I believe it was 10 11. This one should have been outcome. What was the outcome? Uh, this, as you know, injury severe. Yes. Uh, it, as, as it was being cared for, it passed away in the tent under back here. Uh, we do have those. We haven't passed away in the trucks on the way in. This is some of the bad stuff that we do this year. They're so severe, we just can't get there and, and make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and at 814-159-972, came in on 11-13, which was uh, uh, last week. 
It, it was sent to the Arizona State Library of Wisconsin. Uh, it was sent there. Uh, yeah, it to, yeah. The specimen for rabies testing was sent on 11-13 uh, and we're still waiting for results. It's probably good news because then uh, probably not uh, rapid. They, they give us the rabbit test and the results are pretty quick. We usually have a lot of is that, is it just abnormal that we only have one? Uh, it, it, it's uh, maybe uh, a little abnormal that there's only a couple on there now, but we have taken a look at, at the way we do that whole process and, and uh, just uh, don't, and this, this, your, this interest and this oversight, as you, uh, we all know, we take a look at things, uh, things, things get to our, a little closer to where they should be, so that's, that's a part and parcel of the process. Okay. I have a question. Yes, Michelle. On the very first one, I noticed that you that it was a bomb in the case. Yeah. And I was uh, I'm wondering what happened with that one. The owner has until the 26th of November to pay the bond. I'm just showing you that it has until the 26th of November to pay that bond. Well, I have I have a. Does it say that on here? No, it does not. I did, didn't know that on the 14th. It has until November 26th to pay the bond. Yes, ma'am. Well, then, on the, on, the, on the third page of these bonds, I noticed all of these bonds, there are lots of bonds on these, on these cats. That was the Matt Sims County and the bond for all the cats. So what, when do they have to uh, pay the bond? Uh, the owner will serve the bond on 11-13, so they have until the 23rd. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, well then, and could you tell me about one that happened to represent our packet last month? There was a bond case there from last month. It ends in one five seven four four six. Bond has been served to owner, and it's, and it says here, a detective Greenham was involved. Detectives with the county, and the bond was not posted when we met here last month. I I cannot answer that right now. I, I may have had it last month when I was sitting there, but I'll have to go back and look at that. So that's uh, again uh, case number. Well, it ends in um, one seven three four four eight. One seven three four four eight. Is that what that yeah. says? One. Okay, we'll look up and I'll get an answer for you. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever had a one of those hearings? It, ha, has it ever happened that the, <coughs> that the owner has posted the bond and because he wanted to have the hearing? Um, Ms. Ms. Shereen, members of the committee, if I may, I can refer. But your question you have, we have a staff member that in here tonight that can answer the question on that that one piece, if, if that's okay, if you want to. We can get that from, from Dr. Lilly. She can provide that report on that, that bond case with the result. Nina is currently in the clinic. Oh, there you go. Um, yes, the um, father of the female owner was the perpetuator or the abuser of the dog, and they are not in the same home, and Peanut will probably be returned to the daughter who is away from that kind of situation. Oh, and you're talking about this one? Yes, okay. Peanut. You're going to return it to the female owner who was not involved in the abuse. Right. And in fact, she, uh, she's the one that stopped the abuse and took it immediately to her. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, did they post the bond, or was it not necessary to post the bond? It wasn't because the owner was not the person who actually did the oh, Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. And Mr. Shereen, uh, Mr. Chairman, of the committee, the answer to the question is there have been bond hearings, yes. I cannot think of any where the owner was given a call back this time. Mr. Judge, what was the intent of the matter that you put on the agenda? Did you want to see, do we want to see ones that are lengthy? No, actually, all actually, the intent, it was under old business, the intent was to try and reduce the amount of time kept under the holds and under confiscations, and so it's worked out. 
So based on your on your pre previous knowledge, this is uh, a reduction in time? By far. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, yes, Ms. Sean. What I was saying about that, <clears throat> that there's no legal reason to hold an animal. No, and it's just for a legal reason to help win a case. There is no, there's no, absolutely no legal reason to do that. And you, obviously you, you can't do it when the animal's dead, and yet you win cases, you win, you win those cases, and you don't need to, you don't need to hold, we're talking about shortening the hold. They don't need, you don't need to hold an animal to, uh, to, to help win a case. It's not, it's not necessary. And the Animal Control Center has won many cases without having the animal to bring them to court. Just the testimony of the animal control officers is very effective. And the photographs, I didn't get a chance to say that before. And they take photographs of the, of the animal. Some people have said they should take videos, but just the photographs and the testimony alone has been very effective in winning, I think they've won just about 99% of all the cases that have ever been brought into court and without having the animal. Mr. Jacobs, the question is, does that happen? Is that our policy to hold them as just described? Mr. Jacobs, Mr. Shrain, and Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, <clears throat> once the, the the felony abuse statutes were implemented in this state, Brown, which was, I believe, in 2006. Uh, it raised the ante, and it raised the ante for the uh, county attorneys and the trustee attorneys and attorneys that were working on it. And it has progressed into to a point now where <clears throat> there is great utility, great benefit to winning felony cases by demonstrating what it actually takes to rehabilitate these animals. And the, and the attorneys have asked us to do this. Uh, and therefore, when we have a law enforcement agency, as mentioned, one of these cases, Detective Freehand, who happens to be one of our uh, deputies in the Pima County Sheriff's Department, uh, one of our detectives in the Pima County Sheriff's Department, uh, TPD does the same thing frequently, where they, they really want to know, well, what does it take to recover this? And when we do that rehabilitation and can give to the judge actual physical, personally experienced facts about what it took to demonstrate this is what that owner did, this was all it took to get it. It helps seal that felony. That is what the attorney is asking. So to that point, we will certainly take this position, the machine's concern, uh, back to and visit with our attorneys and see if they have any other feelings about that. No, the laws weren't written in there to say that you can or you may or you must keep pets. But for forensic and in judicial reasons, it has, has come to this point, and we'll certainly take that back and talk to them about that. Because they are not so sure, and they're not so concerned, convinced, that we can win the felony cases by just taking photos and having an officer testify what they saw in the scene. One of the things you can do is try and see how well the it works when it comes to photos before a judge or not. That's one thing. We can try that. Second is that oftentimes the dog here, why couldn't it go to a foster while, since it's, a lot of it is weight gain, and so the weight could be then verified, okay, this week it's, you know, 10 pounds and then 12 pounds, or whatever, rather than being in the kennel. So there are some, some other things rather than having the dog here. But, but it's still in you know, our Yes, sir. Sure. That is what, since we're watching the opinion, I have an opinion on this. Sure. Of course, if the judge orders them to be held, that is the question, right? True, but I have a motion in case we have. But it happened. Yeah, sure. So, in my experience, I've seen it happen. Secondly, if the prosecutor says it will improve my case to have a record, this person is an animal abuser, then I'm of the opinion that we should help the prosecutor. Because that's what, you know, we may be a lot about other things, but we're also a lot about not having animal abuse. So I understand you're on a tightrope, and there are other options, as the chairman just indicated, 
but I think we should take great respect to the prosecutor when it comes to animal felony animal abuse. Yeah, um, I supervise Mike Duffy, who is the chair of the Pima County uh, Animal Cruelty Task Force. Well, I guess it's Animal Cruelty Task Force, so there, so not Pima County. And uh, this has come up so many times, and the detectives ask us, please, don't let me have this animal, whatever you do. So we hold animals when they're ill and injured until they're healed. And then we have a program with special foster people who take them, and they understand that at any time they may be, may be asked to take this animal to court. But we don't, as long as the detectives and the prosecutors say, hang on to this dog, we'll hang on to it as long as we have to. Not necessarily in the kennel, but we do have to hang on to them. And so the same thing goes for Pat. Ms. I believe that hanging on to the dog is, or, or a cat or an animal, Beyond that, we is is in conflict with the other law that I was quoting earlier earlier today, the law that allows <coughs> confiscation and keeping animals away <coughs> from bad owners, which was 6.04.130 and 6.04.140 in the county code. That law specifically says the dog should be if. If you, if you do have a hearing and you su and you succeed, which you usually do always or always do, succeed in keeping the animal away from the abusing owner, then the, then the la law specifically says that the, that the animal is supposed to be free at, then at that point to be adopted. That sets the animal free to be adopted and not to be held. But that's not the But this law applies to any 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 case of animal abuse. I tell you what, why don't we why don't we put this on the agenda for next month and we can have more information on it. Can we get that as far as maybe even have someone come down and talk to us as to how I mean I see a lot of cases myself and how you put a case on, every person does it differently. And um, and, and the type of criteria needed to go before uh, a third party is always, uh, it, I mean, they have certain ways of doing it, and we kind of, maybe it'd be a good idea to find out how they do it, what they need to win, and if that's what they feel they need, I think then that's you know, what we need to look at, but um, there's options. Uh, yes, ma'am? We kind of have an idea of an average amount of time they're on hold. Right, because it, it, that's another point, because from my perspective, how long, I mean, there's a lot of delays that go on because I have a large caseload, for example, and then you ask for a delay, and then another delay. So, I mean, those are things that we could ask. Well, how many delays do we need to have to have the dogs sitting here? I'm putting my two cents on, on there is concern about the infant the time animals are here. But we used to have greyhound cases where the animals were here months in months, sometimes well over a year, and that's not helping for the animal to be um, in this environment for that length of time, and that's where we were concerned about, I'm sure. And getting them into a home is, is, is essential, uh, so we do need to address this. <coughs> well, that speaks to what I'm talking so, yeah. about. As far as a case, how long do you need right. before you're putting it on, and do you actually need to have the, the animal there? And we've also had cases where owners have prolonged the animal being in kennel when there should have been a resolution of the master. And it's just because the animal is keeping up with the motions. And so we need to look at that too, please. If, if this happens a lot, that they're delayed because the owner keeps posting or there's uh, an issue with their attorney or whatever to collect. And since we're going to have this one, this may not be the right place, but if these people are all planning to come next month, perhaps we should move this down to the larger auditorium. Papers, since we have people out here in the hallway, they're finally attending. Noted. Okay. Um, okay. So let's move on. All right. The last uh, at this point, uh, the last credit, uh, new business is the criteria required for PAC to respond and investigate service slash welfare issues wherein the animal is in distress. I believe that is your. That is not your Okay, 
I'm going to be recording you a little bit just for the reason for this is I placed, I received a call from an individual who informed me that they had a 13 year old pit bull lab mix who was um, bleeding from the rectum and had blood in the stool. Upon questioning this individual, they had no money for vet care. The dog had had shots from the dog was a puppy and one DHPP when it was about 10. Um, they had resided here in Tucson for about two years. The animal might have had a chicken, cooked chicken carcass two days before they weren't sure. The first thought I thought was when they told me the dog was intact, that it might be a pile truck. And my concern was to get the animal to the vet as quickly as possible. Um, for those of you who do not know what pyometra is, the uterus is coming apart and the animal is, is bleeding uh, and hemorrhaging, basically. Um, I asked for an evaluation at Valley Animal um, and I was told that they discovered a large mass and they were recommending euthanasia. Uh, for people who are familiar with the breed, pit bulls are extremely stoic. Bully breed does not exhibit pain um, such as like a terrier mite or a chihuahua or something that is not uh, quite as uh, muscular. Uh, and I was told upon examination this dog was uncomfortable. Because the people did not have funding and this and I was told there was a very large mass uh, and they were recommending euthanasia. When a vet recommends euthanasia, I really listen to that vet, and that usually means right then. And I talked, and, and they said they were going to talk to the owners. I was called back at 11 o'clock at night, and I offered euthanasia only at that point. And I even said the fee for the visit would be waived, as these people had no money. They put a gentleman on the phone who told me he wanted to take the dog home so that his family could say goodbye to the animal. And I explained to him that in times like this, you need to put your feelings aside and put the, the well-being of that animal ahead of everything else. I even offered to get dressed and go down to the clinic and be with them while they euthanize this animal because they've had this animal for 13 years. He told me, no, it would be fine, he could handle it. I also said because he had a child at home and that child would be closure, that we would have that animal Commingle cremated, uh, or cremated at a pet cemetery, so that they, they had a place to take that child to show you treat the animal with dignity, you you have closure, and he agreed. The next day, I received a call from the, the uh, courier for the pet cemetery. I was told they could not find the dog. I said it's down at the clinic. I was told last night the dog was being euthanized. That's all what we did not agree to have it taken out, whatever the man agreed to, to euthanize. They went back down. They had to call a technician at home. And she said, no, they took the dog home. Um, I talked to the vet that night. He said, I was expecting to see it on my service tonight because they were going to bring it back down. They did not bring the dog back down. I filed a complaint when I found out that the animal had been taken home because I was concerned. Anytime I hear that there is any type of bleeding, I'm concerned. Also, when the veterinarian did the test, they were unsure whether or not it was a parametric. That was not ruled out. The people gave a false address to, the, uh, to, the, to us, to, to our agency. They filled out and the veterinarian. However, the veterinarian has a form that our organization has. The owners provide their pet information, their address. They also have to provide a picture ID. They provided the driver's license. That's where we have obtained the actual address for the individual. I assume that this, be, this call was going to be out. And we have an officer out, and I wouldn't have to worry about it. So I just it to one side saying it's going to be handled. I was asked what the outcome was, what the status of the animal was, if the animal had been euthanized at another clinic, and I didn't have the answer. So I called out here for a report and I was told that 
they were waiting on the vet. There was a breakdown in communication at the veterinary clinic. The veterinarian did not get the message that Pack needed some information from him. They talked to a customer service uh, representative. This started on a Thursday. This happened when I found out about all this information. This was the Monday before Veterans Day. Um, as of the Wednesday after Veterans Day, they, the technician from the clinic had attempted to reach the owners of the animal, and they were told that they had placed the animal with the boyfriend's mother or something, and she was eating chicken and was fine. We don't know where the dog is. And the, the customer service rep was also, she told me she was informed that somebody cannot call on a welfare, a medical welfare call, unless they are veterinarian. And I was concerned about this. So this is what is, why this is on the agenda tonight, because I want to know if a member of the public or somebody calls in, if they're not a vet, and they say, I know this animal was sick, and it was recommended or it needs care, and these people cannot provide it, I want to know what the procedure is to ensure that there's no follow-up. Now, yes, there was a breakdown of communication at the vet's clinic because they did not tell the officer this was a night vet, and they did not ensure that the um, veterinarian received the information. I was told by this vet if he had got, been, received a call, he would have contacted somebody who leaves a cell phone on. So I, I'm just kind of con concerned because this is one case that I'm really worried about. We have no idea where this animal is. <coughs> and we just have somebody who obviously lied on a form. They, they, they gave false information about where the, they lived. And they're saying they don't have the dog anymore. Let me ask you one. Did you call down here knowing that the dog was in distress and tell them that it was in distress? I filed a report that I was told by the veterinarian here. here that the I was told when they called the vet was recommending euthanasia because of the state of the animal. And they also know at the clinic that I told the owner he needed to take the animal's health into consideration. That animal went home without any painkillers because they could not provide any. There was they had no money to provide pain medication. So that animal was sent home in pain. And so I, that's why I was concerned and I wanted somebody to go out and check because, as I said, when a vet veterinarian says, I am recommending euthanasia, I, I listen to them. Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to, to boil it down to mm -hmm. is, are you saying that when you call down here, you wanted them to go check to see yes, his I did. dog. I did. And you were told what? They would place a call. But I mean, are, are you saying that they won't take your word for it and have to be a vet? I guess I did not state that I'm a member of this committee. No, that really wouldn't I mean, matter, it right? shouldn't matter. Um, but I was <coughs> told they would they would file them and they would notify enforcement. Uh, that's I, I I had enough confidence in dispatch, and actually, uh, Randy Crawford was the one who told me that the the address I first received was was invalid. And then when I called back with this other one, I had enough confidence that dispatch was going to get this information to enforcement, and it was going to be handled. And I didn't think twice. And what did you find out? This animal, they don't know where it is. It's our guess. The, the, this animal has fallen through the cracks. I was sure that they're going to follow up on it today. However, when you call in, 
I would like to know what information they need to have. Do I have to have a veterinarian say this or have more complete information? If I'm calling and saying I'm aware of an animal that is, is, is in need of veterinary care, what what more do we need? I mean, as it was in this case, we, we, followed, we investigated pursuant to what we said. We started with the, the veterinary clinic. We said, what do you know about this pet? What, is, what about the address? How can we find this out? And what we were told at that time was, uh, it, again, because of the miscommunication, and the, that we should have been talking to was not, we didn't refer to him. We got some bum information, basically from them at that time, and then said, okay, we'll go check up on these folks, and within a week, based on what they said, because they told us basically, and uh, we, we expect to see them within a week. That's the understanding we had at that time, one at a time. And then, of course, since then, in between that time, you we, we contacted us. So then, by the time we got re-engaged, that was when they found out that the owners had moved and not sure the status of it. So the broad answer your question is, we get complaints from non we follow up on non complaints all the time and follow proper investigative procedures to nail those down. And we, we felt that we did what we were supposed to. We talked to the veterinary clinic and you know, they told us what they were going to tell us and we, couldn't, we didn't want to get it too far in the okay. in, <coughs> in the future, if I have this type of a, a situation, which I hope never happens again, but um, would you like paperwork faxed over from the veterinarians to pack? Um, or I'm yes. uh, sorry, okay. Mr. Chairman. The answer is you have the, the, the enforcement. Super, now, not everybody does. I know that, but they can get them calling. Uh, calling this dispatch will uh, provide them and, and connect them to a supervisor. Talk directly to a supervisor. The best and most efficient way is to get it into that supervisor's hand. Let them answer. I have a question. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's along the same lines, but it, it, it has to do with, we're talking about vets or whatever. Let's say I see it, and I'm not a vet, I see a dog that I can tell is in distress. I mean, it, and you don't have to be a vet to, to see what I'm talking about. They're, they're whining, hurting, whatever. Can I call down here and say, look, this dog's right out, out over right over here, or is in this person's house, and I can see that it is in distress. I don't have to be in that right. to know that. Absolutely. So would, they're supposed to go, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So it doesn't have to just be a vet. No, no, no. In this case, because the vet was right. involved, were involved in the case, we, involved. we started with them, and they said, this is what we saw. Right. I just wanted to get back to that. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, Mr. Jenkins. Since we have the information that's available, and we're suing by the enforcement, and whether it would be appropriate to hear that information? Uh, and Mr. Dick and Mr. Chair, members of the committee, of course, uh, do we have an update to, the, to that particular case? Uh, no, we don't, we don't have any information on the owner. Um, like Ms. Uh, Edward said, that the, the owner was lying about the information that was provided to the dog and to Mrs. Edward. So, and uh, the last known location of the dog was supposedly given to the uh, owner's uh, boyfriend's mother. Which we don't know who that is. No, no follow-up information for us to follow up. No address. No name. I have a question. There. If 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 you're talking to those individuals that initially took the dog to the vet, and then they know we know that the the dog possibly is in harm's way, and they gave the dog to somebody else, aren't they culpable as far as saying you are abusing this animal by giving it to somebody else? You need to show us this dog because they could have the dog in a closet, probably. Right. And it essentially, they could pass it on to whomever, cousin, whatever. But in the meantime, they shouldn't be let off the hook. They're no, the they're still held responsible. Yeah, they're held yeah. responsible. Yeah, they're still so, responsible for it. So that individual that is telling you that uh, the dog went to my mother's brother's cousin's sister, you know, they would still be. You, wouldn't they? Wouldn't you be citing them and telling them? Look, you're the one who would issue citations for neglect after on the owner. Regardless of where the dog ended up, yeah, so, wherever it is, yeah, wherever the dog ends up, exactly. Do you have to go to court to have them bring the dog forward? Yeah. If they say I don't have that, do you have to have an order for them to bring forward the animal, or they, you could just 
say, you know, you, you, think you have to bring it to us and, or, I mean, what, what would they say if they say we don't have it anymore, we don't know where it is, what? Given the circumstances, then we would have to go by the way of a search warrant. Okay. And demand the dog in that, that, that uh, avenue uh, to, to retrieve the animal. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion on this? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have the uh, animal welfare and dangerous animals cases for the month of October. And recent home snapshot. I think we went over a lot of these. Is there any more discussion on this? Did you say the welfare cases now? Yes. Yes, I have something to say about that. This time, ten animals were impounded, and the, the owner, they were in very bad conditions. It's just like ten animals were impounded. Take it out intact, but it costs the 
whole, has to pay all the uh, fees associated with the impound. To get them out, you have to pay uh, a $60 per pet licensing fee for an unaltered animal. Uh, pays all the fees for the shops and everything else that they get. So I have to check to see what this particular uh, individual has decided on his tooth and check out. I thought we recommended a long time ago mm -hmm. in, in one of our meetings is that one of the recommendations was that any animal that makes its way here doesn't come back out. Well, Mr. Chairman, to the committee, that is an ordinance item. It still has to be in this and referred to some ordinances we have to work on. That is part of our plan. I we got the committee's direction, recommendation, advice on that. Right. Understand a lot clear and uh, don't necessarily disagree with it. Um, but we, uh, that has to be processed through the, the process to get things in code, which we still have to do. What do you think? What, what kind of time frame are we looking at? Because that was about six months ago? It, it, yes, sir. It, it was. And uh, that is part and parcel of uh, and the entire um, ordinance that we've been working on for a little bit longer than that, Mr. Yes, quite. Yeah. I guess I'm going to try to get it very by the end of the year. I had that very hard today, so I'll work with Mr. Young. But you said about those two that were, were uh, about the two that were returned. Do you think that they may have been spayed or neutered? I will double check. I would, I would suspect they would, but I will double check. Okay. Mr. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Jeffers. I would give that question a little differently. Were the two? Um, Puppies, two of his own males, or one of the female? Don't know. I, I, I didn't expect you to know. I'm, I want to raise that same question about, you know, were the adults, were the puppies, were the same gender? Or? It was two males. Two males, one female, under adults for age. Yeah, but it doesn't say that was which ones of these were returned. The two males. Two males. Well, it just says the last so it looks like it was the two adult meals because yeah. it says he signed over. That's our schedule. Mr. Green, do you have another question? Yeah, on another on other cases. Say 
number seven? Uh, yes, it's seven. Well, this was an, a, an extremely cruel case. The dog was dead when they picked it up. Uh, it, was left, it was tied up in full sun, with no access to shade, shelter, or water. The owner was punishing the dog because it had defecated in the house the night before, and the next day she forgot about it and left the tie up in the sun, and when she got back, the dog was dead. So my question here is, why wasn't this one handled as a felony? I would have been in favor of this for once because it did not, since the dog was already dead, it did not involve keeping the dog on hold. And if ever there was a felony case, this, this would have been it. Mr. Shereen, Mr. Chairman, may I, and let me, and I hate to drop this hand off. Uh, in court and staff, I believe this is one that they may have some extra audits and additional information. In related to the case, case uh, 147854. So you know, you know, I can answer that question this way. If we have not considered that, that is still, that door is still open to us because we can present that to uh, law enforcement and or the law enforcement prosecutors to see if they want to take that into felony based on the information. Right, right. What did you say? Sir? Well, the county attorney can amend that to a from a misdemeanor to a felony, so they'll go do that case. And we'll, we'll put that right in there. I guess the question is on the second dog, I mean, there, there were pictures taken of the dead dog, and then the second dog, whose name is Goofy, is left there. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though this person, which I'm not really sure why these people's names are, are redacted, but they are, but so he cited his whatever for cruelty, neglect no water, neglect no shelter, neglect tie out on the other dog, Charlie, who died, and for no license on Goofy. Essentially, we know that Goofy's probably going to end up the same way Charlie did, mm -hmm. and we leave him there. I don't get that. I usually chime in on some that I mean that are pretty bad. And, that that's what and I realize they have that authority to make that decision, but I mean, we keep seeing this every week, where you know, the dog, these dogs, you know, were left in the sun, no water, or, you know, this, that, and that, and we keep leaving them there. And I understand we're we're full here. I know we're full here, and so maybe bringing them here isn't good, but leaving them there isn't good either. I'd like to also add something. When this goes to court, I would like a recommendation if the committee agrees, or you can say the Animal Welfare Coalition is requesting or recommending or that the judge consider that this person be banned from having animals again for the length of time the law permits um, because she obviously is not um, in an appropriate place to have an animal. And I, I hate to take the, the bat and say this is punitive, but this is unconscionable. And I agree the animal should have been removed, this other animal should have been removed. And I would also like to see a recommendation that this person be um, prevented from owning any animals for the time that's allowed. And I believe it's three years, and I was hoping we could have that extended to at least five.
even in family, just left right there with that person. Uh, no, no, wait, eight, yeah, that's right. That one, but they were not in family, but that one could have gotten many. And this time was adopted from the, from the back. Hi, Alter and Ongoing Clean. I'm not going to talk directly about this case, but hi, Alter and Ongoing Clean. And I'm wondering if it wouldn't help us all. I mean, anybody could have adopted that dog out. It, it's not over. Any rescue could have adopted them out because people lie on applications and they do what they want to do with the dog and go for um, But. Tieouts and ongoing thinking, and I'm thinking even from my rescue had of putting some kind of educational piece in all my adoption packs that say it is against the law, and why it's against the law. I mean, I've had conversations in rescue with young school age group kids, and they go, "Well, yeah, because Missy keeps jumping the fence. Dad ties her out because she doesn't want to get hit by a car." And I said, but did you stop to think that in the summer when it's 110 and Missy dumps her water and no one's home and you see these awful looks on these kids' faces and they realize that it's not just the parameter of it's on a leash or on a rope, it's what can happen to that dog because it's on a rope. Just a comment. Thank you. Uh, Along those lines. Part of the problem is it is not illegal to sell a tie-out <coughs> mechanism in Pima County. Um, people figure it's it's available at the store, so it's illegal to use. And we need to get these pet stores. We need to get the small ones, the big ones, uh, your your chain stores, any place that sells this to either take it off the shelves or put posting up and we need to do it in a proactive measure and saying, please help us save our community. You have an idea on how to do that? I think what we can start with is maybe drafting a letter from the advisory committee to some of the corporate areas of these, these large places mm -hmm. and hopefully we can maybe get some media involved again because I know we did have a, when the pilot ordinance was passed years ago, it was covered extensively by the media, and that has stopped in, in years since. And so, you want to yes. start a draft? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank the, you. Uh, Pet, Petco Foundation and PetSmart Charities. I know. I know. I went to the general manager of Petco. We talked about this I don't know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, and I said, "You're not messing with the displays. You're not going to put any signs up to say it's illegal in the county." It needs okay. to look like this picture. May, may we put this on the agenda for next month? Sure. Sure. That we possibly add a pan the ordinance that you must post. In, in this municipality, that it is illegal to use crafts. Because they can't tell us that you can't do this with this way. Okay, so it's on the next one, so Jim. One more. Well, um, well, so, one other thing on Goofy, can we find out yeah. who Goofy is?
So he, he goes on and on about how terrible the situation was. And then what and then he says once once he was given water, the dog drank the water immediately. See, this is the kind of thing that wins cases in court without having the dog there. And um, anyway, the, the, the uh, doghouse was blocked by weeds and the whole thing was really terrible. Uh, the animal was not impounded, but it says here um, that a wel welfare check was planned. And do you know what yeah. happened? Well, it was there? planned on 11 5, so. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the uh, welfare check was completed on 11th and they were found. Now, they, they were what? They, found to be, they were found to be in compliance. And now they should get the responsibility for it and work on Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That wasn't announced, so. Not announced? Yes. I, ha I have one more question. Even though we got to the end of the thing. <laughs> but uh, on looking at the the holes, where is that? Well, I can't I can't find it right now. But anyway, I look. I think it was the first example of the holes. Mm -hmm. um, wait a minute, I've got it. Here I've got it. I did make an effort. This is, the, this is the bond case that I asked you about before, and you said they had to go every place to pay the bond. But, um, is the, the reason, now this particular one is not in our packet, and that's because all of this happened in November, and the, and the packet, the, 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 on these welfare cases, take, took place only in October. They is were, that right? Yes, yeah, the, the, they've been completed and the supervisor signed off on the case at the point. This is still a pending case. Uh, and, and it's actually started in, in November, so it's in November. Well, well what, what about the one from last month that I asked, that I asked you about? From last month's report? Yes. That, that was probably a September case. I'll just, i got to go back and check up on it. Well, it says here, uh, no, October, October 8th, confiscate field, uh, field owner. It seems to be an October oh. case. Oh, I see what you're saying. That, and it was a bond case. But this, this bond, this case was never put in our packet, was it? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not wrong, but I'll check on it. it so I, I remember it's been asked once before about which, which, or how are you choosing those ten cases that you do? And uh, is it just at random? Because I know we, we are we missing which ones do we not get? And how many do we not get? We get ten. How many, if you have given us all of them, how many would there have been? Let's see. There would have been one. That month we handled uh, 2,404 <laughs> enforcement calls. 2,404 <laughs> calls. You mean there were 2,000? There were 2,404 uh, enforcement calls that were responded to. Some of those were wage and parking dog and those types of things, but there are several that generate reports like this to the tune of thousands. Really, uh, I mean, when we got the 10, there would have been thousands if they had gotten That's what he said. Thousands. Yes. Yeah, thousand plus, yes. Yeah. Probably closer to 2,000 and 1,000. Oh, my goodness. So the answer is, uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Supervisor Cooks there, Dr. Cooks, is one of the officers that helped put this together, and they select 10 to their field of representative of the types of things that our staff is doing for your information. We had uh, donations for the month of uh, October of 
eight cents. Okay, complaints and commendations. There were three complaints, no commendations received by staff in October. Uh, with that, we have the last call to the audience. I have three people. And uh, we'll start off with uh, Karen Pope. I'm Karen Pope. I have been a foster within the arms of angels for the past year and a half. And what we do in our family is we help the pregnant moms that come from PATH, we take one at a time. We help her raise her litter. Through rescue, she is spayed. Her puppies are spayed and neutered. They are all vaccinated. They are all brought then into the community to be available for adoption through the rescue organization. Those families uh, do have to fill out an application process. They do get interviewed, and it's much stronger than the application process to pick up an animal from PATH. You don't get to take one of these puppies if you're going to have it be an outside dog. They are only allowed in families. Yes, this is a very touchy subject and everybody cares a lot about it. But when we're looking at public health and when we're looking at the health of these dogs, I agree 100% that spay abortion, even at term, is better than having their puppies inside pack. I agree with that 100% because it's not fair to those moms for them to raise their puppies in a shelter environment. But in a home environment, when rescue homes are available, we can provide a service to the community that provides healthy puppies that are spayed and neutered, that go into homes where they could have chosen to purchase a dog through a breeder who had 500 dogs. They could have chosen to purchase that puppy and have a dog who is then not spayed or neutered or vaccinated. And that dog will go on to be a dog having puppies. So we are addressing that overpopulation problem by helping those individual mothers. When the rescue community is asking for 72 hours of notice, we're asking for a chance to help puppies go into homes where they're already spayed, already neutered, already vaccinated, well cared for, not left in the outside, not tied up to a fence. We're asking to help that happen. And those families choose the choice of purchasing or adopting a rescue dog who already has all of those things met. If that choice is not available to them when they make the decision to go get a dog, they may choose not to come to the pound to pick up the sick puppies that are here. They may choose to go to the community and purchase dogs from the people like we've heard of today, where they have 400 or 300 dogs and are not well cared for. If we want to address that problem, we need to address it in the animals that are leaving and going into homes. And we can do that. And we can't address it with the dogs having puppies here at PATH, but 72 hours is not that long to ask. So far, our family has helped five mothers. One cat, four dogs. We've um, transitioned into the community 48 puppies and kittens who were sick. Dogs who were sick, we helped them get healthy. We helped them find good homes. And they are not part of the problem. They're not, they are part of the solution. That's what I have to say. Tiffany Rossman. I, uh, I want to wholeheartedly agree with what Karen had to say. By any stretch of the imagination, we're not asking for Pima Animal Care to x-ray dogs to find out if they're pregnant or to facilitate them in this building. That would be ridiculous because it's not a safe environment. However, rescues do have safe environments. We limit our foster homes to one family per home, and we can provide that service that she said. I, too, have a story. I adopted a puppy from Pima Animal Care in 2009, who a month later died from this tumor. A year later, I decided to get into rescue specifically to help pregnant animals so that people like myself, who are not going to buy from a breeder or a puppy mill, has an option to adopt a rescue puppy. That's all. Thank you. 
My response is to what Mr. Garcia said about rescue is down. And I didn't even want to bring this up, but it has to be brought up. The rescue is down, in my opinion, for putting someone in a position that has a lackluster attitude, that is coddled by the rescue staff, and that doesn't have any motivation, that has very low self-esteem in her position, and doesn't want to communicate. So she has a lot of other people standing up for her. I have found it to be very uncomfortable to deal with that person. So I've gone to her next person in charge, and that's who I deal with. The other day, I was told that he was going to have a talk with one of the volunteers because the volunteer was hostile. And he said to me, I'm going to take care of this. And I said, when that person, you allowed that person to get to that position, you thought that they could handle that position. If they're going to be in that position, they need to start opening up and communicating with their fellow rescues, with their fellow special needs. There is a huge lack of communication by that person. And until that is done, and until the protection of her is stopped, you will see a downsize of rescues coming in. I used to never, ever rescue from anywhere except PAC. I had total devotion to PAC. Now, I rescue from Maricopa. I rescue from Wilcox. I rescue from Cornell. And the reason being is because I can talk to someone that is a rescue coordinator, and that's her job. That's what she does. And she, I, she doesn't push me to someone else to take care of her dirty work. She communicates with me. She talks with me. She is part of the solution. If I say to them, you know, let's work together and try to get that animal out, they are gun ho And they're not perfect. By all means, Pinnell kills so many. Maricopa, Hort, but they have strong people in those positions that really want to save lives. And they don't have any supervisors that I've had to talk to when I say, let's work together. They are like, right on, Terry. You know, let's, you're right. And they go the extra mile to get that animal out. I don't see that at PAC anymore. And that's why you're losing rescues. Right. It's not because, you, it's not any better because you have special needs. You know why you have special needs? Because the volunteers and the rescue organizations are out there working their ass off, their behind off, to turn people on, to network, to get on social media, to get on Craigslist, to get you all those special needs. It's not your <coughs> rescue staff that is out there pounding the pavement every single day. It's not your rescue staff that is out there communicating to the public. It is your volunteers, it's your rescue organizations that do all of the work, 99%. Thank you. Out of curiosity, how many people are planning on attending next month's meeting? What's the agenda? <laughs> <laughs> Rescue is one of the items. I would like to make a motion because it is something to accommodate the audience that we lose that particular meeting today. All in favor? Opposed? Next month's meeting will be at the end of the Alright. Any more any announcements, schedules, proposed agenda items? Should I add now? The uh the next holiday dog walk is the Wagon Ralph. And I think this is the beginning of the third year. In the beginning of the third year, we started. This will be our third Thanksgiving walk, third Thanksgiving Day walk. 